Uh, I'm trying to do things different uh, from time to time so it doesn't become monotonous. <clears throat> I didn't write out everything today. Sometimes I write out just about everything and then I don't get the chance to cover it all. And uh, last week I felt like I uh, maybe went in too much detail talking about Samaria, about how it all got started and how they bought the property and how it came about. <clears throat> and uh, you probably felt you probably felt like you were in a biblical backgrounds class in seminary with all that background material. <clears throat> and um, but what I wanted to do was to show that the Samaritan Israel conflict didn't just start overnight. It was going on for almost 700 years. And when you got 700 years of fighting going on, it doesn't just reveal itself, resolve itself in a very short period of time. <clears throat> and that was the reason I went into so much detail. It always helps me to know the detail behind of what I'm working with, of what I'm studying in the Bible. The more history, the more I understand the background, the better it is to understand the context. <clears throat> I'm also going to do a little something different this morning. It's been a while since I talked about reading the Bible through. And um, I don't know how many of you are still on target to try to read the Bible through this year. <clears throat> I just finished uh, Second Kings yesterday, or day four yesterday, moving on through. And uh, I realized how one of the biggest helps that I had as I was reading through was well, one of these little books that I've got. It's not a little book, but one of these books that I've got. Uh, Bible charts and maps and Bible times and lines. I've got about four or five of these different kinds of books that are basically just outlines and maps of the Bible. <clears throat> but one that I used going through First and Second Kings, First Samuel, Second Kings, First Kings, is this chart here. And if anybody would, would be interested in it, um, maybe Jonathan can print it out. But as you read through First and Second Kings, uh, Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, <clears throat> you see all the names of these kings. And they would say, in the third year of King Peckham, a king of Israel came along, a king of jo uh, Judah came along. And so I'm sitting there, who is who here? You've got kings of Israel, kings of Judah, and they're mentioned in the same paragraph, but they're talking about just one king. And so to me, it's kind of a head spinning to try to keep it all together. So this is a chart in this <coughs> book. These are all the kings of Judah, and these are all the kings, I mean, these are the kings of Israel, and these are the kings of Judah. And a lot of times, the same, both names are mentioned in the same verse. And so you don't really remember, know who they're talking to. <clears throat> now, I was not interested when we went through this in school. <clears throat> I just wasn't interested in memorizing all these kings and there was the names. It just wasn't something that, that I was interested in. <clears throat> but it is important to know who's who um, in some of the most important ones. So <clears throat> if you'd like this, maybe Jonathan can print it out and give it to you and he can let you know and you can, as you go through I figured some of you have made it to Kings by now. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but <laughs> <clears throat> some of you probably made to Solomon and Samuel and Kings as you're working your way through the through the Bible. I hope you're still on target moving through. <clears throat> if you want some of these books, this was the one. This is one of the ones I like. It's called Rose Books. And uh, it's got just a massive amount of information in it, all kinds of charts and diagrams and history of what happened to different people in the, in the Bible if you have a hard time keeping up with all those names. It's just a, a really good uh, overall view of the, of the Bible. <clears throat> but this was one of the most helpful charts. And even as you go through, not just those books, all the way through the prophets, because they mention the kings in the prophets, all through there. <clears throat> For example, Uzziah was king during uh, Isaiah. 
Uh, does anybody remember what happened to you, Uzziah? Uzziah. You what now? I was repeating the name. <clears throat> Uzziah was a good king. He lived a long time. But he had leprosy. Hmm. Because he went into the temple when he wasn't supposed to and offered the sacrifice. <clears throat> and God said, I told you, you're not supposed to do that. So he was developed, he developed leprosy. Wow. And then he went in, he had to live in a separate house and his son <clears throat> was actually king the whole time that he lived. Uh, it was king. He was king in name and in power, but his son was the face of it. <clears throat> so a lot of those things, you know, just something interesting to know about these different people. Uzziah was one of the more important ones, kings. <clears throat> what I want to do today is take another look at the woman at the well and um, Nicodemus. Now, I know ahead of time that I might get myself in a heap of trouble today. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is the difference in how men and women make decisions. Yeah, <laughs> 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 what you say? That's not a subject you're going to get into. I'm not touching that one. <laughs> <clears throat> well, there is a difference, as you might know. <laughs> and why is that difference? Because we're different, I guess. Well, <laughs> you know, that's very astute. <laughs> that's very right. <clears throat> we were in a marriage enrichment conference in Brazil, <clears throat> and a pastor took his wife with him that was leading the conference. They're from Tennessee. Everybody in his room knows who they are. Pastor of one of the largest churches in Nash, Tennessee. <clears throat> and she kept making a statement. And eventually, by the end of the second day, I had about enough. <laughs> and so I made a comment. <clears throat> and um, it went all right, but not as good as I thought it would. <laughs> 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 she said that a man's brain is defective. It's not. Man's brain is defective. Oh. Woman's brain is the only one that operates perfectly. Oh, man. Oh, man. Good, no. So she kept saying that about three or four times for the first two days. <clears throat> and she said, uh, a man's brain can only think of one thing at a time. She said, a woman's brain can think of a lot of things at the same time. Yeah, divergent. <clears throat> and so she said, and and I guess, I don't know if y'all studied the anatomy of the brain. Maybe you know already why that happened. <clears throat> but in birth, the, both hemispheres of the brain are connected. But a few days, weeks, months later, the man's brain is divided. It's separated in the two hemispheres. And the connections between the two are not there anymore. Now, they used to do this lumbotomy. They used to say somebody had problems, they would do that surgery. <clears throat> but it happens natural, uh, the way God created us. And so she said that over and over and over again, that a man's brain is defective, a woman's brain is normal. And so... <laughs> After a while, I finally got up and said, well, <clears throat> you know, I didn't have anything to do with that. That was predetermined from creation that God made it that way. Now, this is where I got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, at least I can think of one thing at a time and stay on topic without going everywhere at the same time. <laughs> now, I, uh, in decision making and evangelism, I studied Carl Jung, and he has a lot of material on how people make decisions. So if I'm going to be involved in evangelism, I want to know how people make decisions and how you approach people. 
So I read this book. It's called Don't Just Think Pink. Don't just think pink. <laughs> it's how women make decisions on what they're going to buy. <clears throat> the book was very, very good. It mentioned a lot of processes of how women <clears throat> go about making a decision. Now, that's extremely important if you are in decision-making process. <clears throat> it's also very important if you're bringing volunteers overseas because women make the majority of decisions on whether or not to go overseas on a mission trip. <laughs> They're the ones that make the decision <clears throat> because the amount of money that's involved in it. You don't ask a family to spend three, four, five thousand dollars on a mission trip if they're going to take their husband, wife, and kids and everybody overseas. <clears throat> the woman is going to make the majority of that decision as to whether or not to spend that much money on a mission trip. <clears throat> now, let me ask you, and I also read a book years ago. I couldn't find it. I was going to review it before I came this morning. <clears throat> I couldn't find it right away. It's a little pamphlet. Things women worry about. Women worry about things different from what the men, things men worry about. And so if you're going to approach a decision process, you're going to have to deal with things people <clears throat> worry about. You know the hierarchy needs that uh, fellow created. Maslow. I forgot his name. Maslow. Maslow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I thought he dealt with dogs. Yeah. It's Pavlov. Pavlov, huh? That's <laughs> Pavlov. Pavlov. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> anyway, you've got to deal with those hierarchy of needs. Well, there's a different hierarchy of needs for men and women. So you've got to, you've got to work with things differently. I'm leaving, leaving this, le leading up to this because every once in a while I'm going to do something on evangelism because that's what I've been doing since 18 years old. Uh, studying, training, equipping <clears throat> in evangelism. So how a person makes a decision is critically <clears throat> important to me. <clears throat> now, the ladies, if you don't mind, this group is a very tight group, I know. They're very open with each other. What are some of the things you worry about? Probably my children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Grandchildren, right. great grandchildren, <clears throat> especially those that are lost. Anything else? I don't, I don't really worry. Um, I guess it would call I would call it more concern, but I don't really worry if there's nothing I can do about it. Okay. <clears throat> Most likely at. Uh, Sometimes my wife says you need to be more careful how you talk because you say things that, that people take the wrong way. But um, It's natural that as the older we get, we learn how to handle worry better. Yeah. <clears throat> my brother once told me, he said, uh, he's not really active in church, but he said, one piece of information I learned, never get between a woman and her money. <laughs> Say that again. Never get between your wife and her money. Oh, don't get between a woman and her money. I do what? <laughs> I really don't have any money, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, well, security is another reason <clears throat> women worry about security, health, mm -hmm. health. family. Now, what is one of the number one reasons you make a decision on what to buy, where to go, or what to do? What is one, one factor that you take in? What's it going to cost? Uh-huh. Have it. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that they said in this book, they said women make a decision based on recommendation from another woman. That is a big factor. Influence. Recommendation. 
And so we made several videos to, um, for volunteers coming over. And I would ask the same series of questions to the ladies and the men. But since I knew the women made the majority of the decision, I would focus more on them than, than the, the men in terms of coming down. And uh, I would ask them, I said, do you feel safe down here in Brazil? Do you feel safe? Oh, yeah, I, I feel perfectly safe. I'm not worried about anything. Oh, now, we did take care of all the safety issues, so there was no safety. Because remember, we're targeting the whole family. And I said, I would ask them, said, how has the mission trip affected your family? And that's when the yes answers went up through the roof. They said, oh, yes, this has been perfect. My kids now see what I'm talking about, about being so thankful for things when they're down here seeing people that don't have anything. Mm -hmm. My children are totally different when they come back home. Totally different. I wouldn't take anything from my kids being on this mission trip. And I would ask them, are you worried about their health? Gosh, no. Gosh, no. And I, I'd ask this one boy down there, I said, uh, how's the food been? Because I knew that kids concerned about food. He said, oh, this is great. For the first time in my life, I went to a restaurant and I got full because I could eat everything I wanted. <laughs> and it just kept coming. <coughs> and I just ate and ate and ate and we played football. And he said, I, this is perfect. I love this place. Because we went to an all-you-can-eat uh, barbecue place. Oh. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> they just keep bringing the steaks out. And then I asked this, this one lady, uh, I talked to her, I said, how has your daughter been? I kind of semi-knew the answer because she's been down probably close to five times already, bringing her children down, her daughter down. And, and she could not talk for any length of time without tears. And she said, I saw my daughter today lead her first person to Christ that she's ever led to a Christ in her life. Hmm. And I saw that. Right. And I wouldn't take anything for that. I saw her learn how to witness down here. I saw her minister to people the first time down here. And, and it, it just made such a tremendous difference in our home. And then I'd ask her, I'd, next video I'd ask, well, uh, how, how's your husband been? Oh, this trip was worth every dime. This trip was worth every dime. He is such a different person. He is so much better to me. He's so much better at home. He's leading our home spiritually that he hadn't done before. Uh, it's, just a, it's just tremendous. <clears throat> and, and then I, we had a lot of nurses. That one of the things we had, and most of the ladies that came down were in some kind of form of health uh, field. <clears throat> and so I asked her, I said, uh, can you think of anybody at home that you would recommend going on a mission trip? And she said, I'm thinking about it right now. She said, there's three other ladies that are on my floor at the hospital that I'm going to ask to come next year on a mission trip. <clears throat> and so once you cover those three or four things, you've pretty much got a decision to go on a trip. Uh, because people are, are scared of doing a lot of things. And going overseas, sometimes people are scared of going overseas. They don't realize that we've never had anybody hurt on one of our mission trips. Uh, the only thing that we've ever had is uh, on a construction team, uh, somebody fell off of scaffold and broke their ankle. But that's about it. I mean, it, you're going to have that happen regardless of where you have a construction team. <clears throat> but nobody's ever been hurt on um, one of our evangelism or one of our medical teams. Now, let's move it a little bit closer to home. <clears throat> my oldest son, my middle son, is, I think I told you that he is more of a, a salesman. 
He knows stuff. <clears throat> and he uh, was working for Verizon. He got graduated from college and he was going to go to work for the Alabama Correction Department and he hurt his leg and, and so he had to find something else till his leg healed. <clears throat> and he uh, started one of the jobs he had was selling phones at a kiosk in, uh, in a mall. And <clears throat> the Lord blessed his understanding and he became number one salesman. <clears throat> and he was talking to, some, a man came up and he asked this other lady that was in the selling, what's the difference between these two phones? And the lady kept saying, well, this one looks pretty. This one, you can get a different cover on it. And you can have all these things and you can talk to all your friends and all this kind of stuff. And the guy didn't buy it. And my son walked up and said, that's not what he's interested in. He could care less how pretty the phone is. <laughs> he wants to know what this phone does and what this one does. And so he said, this phone does this, this, and this. And this phone won't do it, and it does this, this, and this. In less than a minute, he said, I'll take this one. <clears throat> if you don't know what the person wants, is interested in, you can talk all day and not hit the topic. There was another person come in, and uh, they were, I think it was Spanish, they were speaking. It's been a while since I heard this. And, and nobody wanted to deal with them, because all he wanted to do was to pay his bill. Well, Stephen, he knows Spanish and Portuguese, so he said, I'll talk to her. By the end of the time, he sold seven phones to her. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, she said, well, what, ha what happened? He said, well, I told her that with this phone, you can go on some kind of family and friends dealing, and you can pay one bill, and it would cut your phone bill by 60% or something. If you buy all of these, you'll save a lot more money in the long run. She said, okay, I'll buy this one. I'll buy six more, five more, whatever it was. I don't remember right now. Buy more phones. So he sold six, seven phones. <clears throat> I say all that to say this. <clears throat> when you're in involved in evangelism, every book that I've read recently in the last 10, 12 years on evangelism, there's a new item in it that I didn't see at first. And that is, you've got to listen. It's important to listen to the person that you're talking to. Now, you've got to know a little bit of psychology, I'll admit. You've got to learn a little bit of what the person is, is what they're going through, how they're dealing with. <clears throat> now, what do you see? The next thing is, and this is a good and bad thing, on the women's side on making decisions. You can read a lot of studies on this. It's all over the internet. It's all books and books and books and books are written on this subject about decision making between men and women. <clears throat> um, but women will make a decision, gather a lot of information. You take a look at the woman at the well. How much information did she want? How much information did she try to gather from Jesus? How much information did Nicodemus want? His amount of information was just a thimbleful. That's all. He, he didn't want to know, how does this thing work? Let's get down to the bottom line. Let me make my decision. What do I need? I know you came from God. I know God. you can't do anything except God's with you. So I want to know. How do I get this thing done? She said, I've got all these questions. Why did you Jews burn down our temple 100 years ago? How come you say it's here and they say it's there? How come this? How come that? Why this? Why that? Why that? If, when you evangelize a, 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 a lady, you're going to need to know all those answers. You're going to need to be prepared for all that information coming at you. That's a reason that I mentioned that it's important to know the gospel. You've got to know the gospel. And that's the reason that paper I handed out several months ago about all the words that describe the gospel. I think I got 45 
words on there that describe the, the gospel. The better you know the gospel, just like my son selling phones, he knew that phone. He knew everything it could do. He knew why it did it and how you go about getting it done. And if you're dealing with a, a, a man, you've got to know that kind of stuff, and a woman, both of them, because he was also number one salesman at, uh, at Best Buy when he was there. And sometimes he starts talking to me, and we start talking and dealing with something. I said, look, I'm not one of your customers, so you don't need to go through all that stuff with me. <laughs> you know, don't, pretty much, don't, don't come at me like you're trying to sell me something, because uh, it's just in his nature. <clears throat> so... Uh, well, I went through it faster than I thought I would. But the other thing about evangelism in this chapter, this place, is Jesus said, one of you going to sow and one of you going to reap. Mm -hmm. He said the same thing in 1 Corinthians. I sow, Apollos water, but God gives the increase. <clears throat> so men have a trouble with this one man that I went through in evangelism. He, did, he was very, very good, but he came up to me at the end. He said, you know, after, I used, after you trained me, I led four or five people to Christ. And then I went up to this one fellow, and he didn't want to receive Christ. What am I doing wrong? He said, so far, everybody I've talked to got saved, and this guy didn't want to. And I said, well, the Lord gave you some beginner's luck, I guess. I didn't use that word, but uh, you just happened to run into the right people. But it's not always going to be that way. It's not always going to be that way. I did knock on one door, and uh, it was a Nicodemus door. Um, we knocked on this door, because I went up and down the streets with my group of people that I was training all the time. And this uh, one fellow, I said, do you mind if we come in? We told him who we were. He said, I'm glad you came by said, I am reading right now at my dining table this passage where this guy named Nick, or whatever his name is, he, he couldn't figure out what it meant to be born again. Do you have any idea what it means to be born again? Can, can you come in and explain that to us? And so you're going to run into those, but you've got to know what you're talking about. And that's the reason you've got you to study. Well, I did... I. I didn't write out my notes, but I still didn't get through with what I was thinking about. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, the thing I hope you take away is one, if you want to have this chart of the, of the uh, kings, it's very helpful reading through after the book of Judges all the way to the end of the Old Testament. Because they're mentioned over and over and over and over again, all the way through to the end. And uh, it's just helped to have that background. Second thing is there's a difference between how people make decisions. <clears throat> when I go into a home, I want to find out, is this person, what kind of job do they have? <clears throat> if they're an engineer, I talk to them one way. If, they're not an, if, they, if, they, if they deal with an analytical mind, I deal with them one way. If they want the facts, deal with them one way. I know deal with them is not a good phrase but I talk to them one way. If they want a personal testimony, I'll adjust it to a personal testimony. <clears throat> so it's a lifelong process, but uh, you gotta study to learn how to be a good sharer of the gospel. Paul said, I've become all things to all people that I might win some. Well, five over, let's pray. <laughs> Father, thank you for the time together. Thank you for your great love towards us. Lord, just give us wisdom to know how to reach people. And give us wisdom to know how to communicate the gospel to different people who think different from us, who have different outlooks on life, who have different problems. But all of them, you have created in each one of them the desire to know for sure where they'll spend eternity. Well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.